Welcome to our Curious Amalgam, the weekly podcast brought to you by the Antitrust Law Section of the American Bar Association. Our Curious Amalgam explores the fascinating and increasingly overlapping world of competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law. Each week, we bring you leading global experts on the most compelling issues of the day. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome to Our Curious Amalgam, the podcast from the American Bar Association Antitrust Law Section. My name is Christina Ma, and today's topic is What's Next for Antitrust Enforcement? The Antitrust Section's Presidential Transition Report. For the last several decades, the Antitrust Section has published a Presidential Transition Report setting forth the Section's views and recommendations for the incoming administration. This year's report, the ninth of its kind, was pulled together by a task force of 20 lawyers, professors, and economists and represents the Section's expertise, diversity of viewpoints, and breadth of experience. Today, we will hear from the co-chairs of that task force as they highlight some of the key takeaways from the compendium. And you can, of course, access the full report at ourcuriesamalgam.com. Joining me today is my co-host, Sergei Zazovsky. Hi, Sergei. Hi. Hi, Christina. So what are we talking about today? Well, as you said, we're talking about the ABA Presidential Transition Report. And why is it important? Uh, well, it's a document that summarizes the most important antitrust and consumer, prote- uh, consumer protection issues of the day and really serves as a guidepost for the incoming antitrust leadership on the most important questions to focus on. Uh, and it's particularly important at this juncture where there are a lot of calls for reform and antitrust law, at least potentially, may be undergoing a profound change. Great. I couldn't agree more. Um, who are we talking to today? Uh, so we are very lucky to welcome two of the most recognized name, names in antitrust and the leaders of the Transition Report Task Force. We have Rich Barker and Bill McLeod. Great. Well, without further ado, um, Rich and Bill, welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks. A real pleasure. So welcome, Rich. Welcome, Bill. And uh, let me start with you, Rich. Can you tell us uh, what is the purpose of the transition report? Uh, What are you trying to accomplish? It's um, very simple, and it's to be helpful. Um, The report starts out with a statement to the effect that antitrust is at a major inflection point. And I think it is for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, Accepted wisdom is being challenged. Um, Questions about whether um, antitrust has been or is and will be in the future up to the task of protecting consumers. Uh, And we now have an administration who is coming in to um, their jobs in the midst of this. And so um, the purpose of this document is simply to help them by setting out what we consider to be uh, the key issues that deserve government focus, that deserve uh, serious attention, uh, and to try to help them set the agenda. Set the, that's what, what a leader has to do is set the table, set the agenda. And I think the pur- and the, I know the purpose of this report is to assist them in doing that, and we most certainly uh, I hope it does. Well, certainly uh, an extremely important task at this point in time. And let me turn to you, Bill. Can you tell us a little bit about the process for coming up with the report? Like how long did it take? Who was involved? Uh, Tell us how this all came together. Sergey, we have been working on this report for the better part of a year. And when I say we, I am talking about two dozen of the most respected and diverse set of authorities we could find for antitrust and consumer protection. It includes former assistant attorneys general. It includes former chairs and commissioners of the Federal Trade Commission, academics, lawyers in private practice, a bipartisan group that we try to assemble and then we encourage to reach consensus on all of these issues. Every four years, this is what the section has tried to do. And that's what we're doing this year. And we are very proud of the work that they all did. Well, it certainly sounds like uh, quite an undertaking. 
And I know that uh, this is not your first rodeo, that you've been involved with some prior reports as, as well. And uh, I know certainly this is also a unique time. In many ways, this is a unique presidential transition, and it's a unique time in the development of the antitrust law. So given all that, how is this report different, if at all, from the prior ones? I'd say it's different in two respects. It's different, number one, in that it covers a broad waterfront. We go from cartels to civil enforcement to mergers to consumer protection. We get into some of the critical issues that the critics of antitrust have raised and that the defenders of antitrust have answered. And we try to get to the bottom of all of those. So this is going to be a report that is especially comprehensive. And it's going to answer, I think, a demand that we have not seen in recent times. Antitrust has been the subject of congressional hearings, congressional reports, volumes of books and articles. People are asking of antitrust any number of remedies and solutions to a lot of what is ailing society and what our report tries to do is to give a sense of where antitrust may be able to answer those questions. Well, certainly antitrust has been in the spotlight uh, more than I can remember at any time in history. Uh, and uh, it's a good time to dive into the substance of this report uh, now that we are excited about what's in it. So uh, to start with the first substantive question, let me turn to Rich. Uh, one of the most crucial debates in antitrust law is over the consumer welfare standard, uh, whether the consumer welfare standard ought to remain the guiding principle of the antitrust law or whether there are broader considerations, both economic and non-economic, that ought to play a larger role. What position does the transition report take on this uh, debate? Well, um, naturally, and I'm glad it was your first question because it is so central, it has been the guiding principle uh, of antitrust since uh, the Sylvania case and uh, Sonatone and maybe others a very long time ago. Um, and, and, and now um, the debate about whether there's been enough enforcement um, uh, ends up being a debate about whether the consumer welfare standard is sufficient. So what we recommend um, is that the FTC use what I think is a very useful um, device, that is Section 6B, to do a study uh, and really look objectively at the issue of whether we have a problem of durable market power in the United States uh, and whether we're looking at a problem going forward of durable market power in the United States and whether the consumer welfare uh, implemented by outstanding uh, in for, consumer welfare standard implemented by regulators and the courts uh, is up to the task. Uh, and, and, and that is central. That's, uh, the agencies really do need uh, to look at that. Uh, we do not opine on the difficult question of whether we have a durable market pro power problem in the United States. There's scholarship on both sides. Uh, but we do say that the consumer welfare standard is likely to be good enough because it does include um, innovation. It's not just price. It does include innovation service uh, and the other competitive um, uh, dynamics. So it's likely to be okay. It's likely to be okay going forward. Maybe it needs to be rethought, uh, but that's sort of where we come out. But the main point is we prescribe a serious look under 6B at the, um, at the issue uh, of concentration and a serious, thoughtful consideration of the consumer welfare standard. And of course, the agencies uh, can think about it all they want. Um, uh, uh, the key is, is whether 
there's either legislation or whether uh, the courts ultimately buy it. But at least the agency ought to kick the ball off and put it in play to use a to use a sports analogy. Well, that makes sense. And on a personal level, I'm very glad that you and the report is uh, bringing clarity to this by reiterating that consumer welfare standard uh, does cover innovation and non-price effects as well. Because I think a lot of times uh, the question gets miscast a little bit as should we have the consumer welfare standard or should we look at innovation and quality effects as well? And of course, I think most people who are support the consumer welfare standard believe consumer welfare standard does take innovation and quality effects into account. So I think uh, the question gets less airtime, but maybe just as important as can we develop the economic tools that allow us to look at quality and uh, innovation and other non-price effects as precisely as we look at the price effects. Uh, but definitely a very interesting issue to track. Uh, if I can turn to you, Bill, uh, let me ask you about uh, Section 2, uh, monopolization law. There's been a lot of debate about whether the current interpretation of Section 2 is sufficiently mm-hmm. expansive to rein in uh, unilateral conduct by powerful firms. Uh, what does the report have to say on this subject? Well, the report has to say that the agencies really need to weigh in with their views on some of the issues that are dividing the circuits. For example, how do you treat refusals to deal, unilateral refusals to deal? We have different standards and different circuits. And the report says this is an area that needs some clarification. And the agencies are obviously in the central position to make that clarification. Obviously, there's a lot of action going on right now that has recently occurred, so we might be seeing some of that. But it is a part of antitrust enforcement where the private sector has done much more than the enforcement agencies over a long time. Uh, Until recently, I could boast having brought more monopolization cases myself than the two agencies have brought. That is an odd position for our public antitrust enforcers. So this is an area where we are, of course, expecting to see activity, but most importantly, it's an area where it will be very important to hear what will the standard be is, for example, an efficiency of a unilateral refusal to deal enough to defend that refusal altogether? Or should there be a balancing test in which the scope or the scale of the efficiency is measured against the anti-competitive effect of the refusal to deal? These are issues that are at the forefront of Section 2 right now. And the report says it is high time for these issues to be resolved. Certainly a lot of questions to answer on Section 2. And I think a lot of questions to answer in our (laughs) next area of discussion as well, merger control. And let me turn back to Rich here. Uh, I think one of the toughest questions uh, facing enforcers in merger control is how to treat acquisition of potential or nascent competitors. Uh, A lot of commentators believe that the traditional doctrine makes it too difficult to successfully challenge uh, these types of mergers. But on the other hand, (coughs) some of the proposals currently out there uh, that make it easier to challenge such mergers would risk preventing a lot of potentially pro-competitive mergers. Uh, It's a really tough, thorny issue. Uh, What take does the report uh, have on this uh, problem? Well, we put that issue front and center, and there's a whole chapter, uh, as you might expect, on merger control in the uh, in the paper. And we put that question front and center because remember what the problem is. Well, our report assumes no legislation. Um, our report assumes that the law is the law, um, and so you have a standard that requires a likelihood 
a likelihood of a substantial lessening of competition. Um, and, you know, which means um, uh, there has to be something concrete going along. So we ask the question whether uh, potential competition doctrine should be limited to situations where the uh, 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 the B side likely would enter the market in which the acquiring firm now competes within a reasonable time and two, the acquiring firm currently has an overlapping product, i.e. not really developing one, and whether there is a, uh, that limitation would constrain uh, the agencies. Some people would say, well, the, you know, the statute is the statute. It requires a substantial lessening of competition, uh, and, and it doesn't talk about ephemeral possibilities, um, other people would say, well, we need to push the boundaries of the law uh, to cover uh, uh, truly nascent uh, uh, acquisitions. Uh, and, it, you know, our report puts that out as, as one of the central issues uh, to be considered. Uh, and the agency should be actively involved in that in terms of bringing cases um, that, if they so choose, push the boundaries of the law or uh, participating in amicus and other, other kinds of things like that. Very central issue that is front and center in the United States right now. Uh, it certainly is. And, you know, a lot of uh, uh, needs to be worked through to get to uh, consistent doctrine on that, that people – on both sides of the fence are happy with. What's your personal view on uh, where we should end up in terms of uh, mergers involving potential competitors? I, I, my personal view is, is that the current standard uh, is, uh, is, is adequate. Um, I think that um, uh, I'm going to take a conservative view here. I think that, um, that uh, the current standard is adequate and it's fair and it's consistent with the uh, with the statute uh, uh, that we have. Um, um, otherwise, I think you get off into a never never land of pre- preventing an acquisition that, uh, where there may or may not ever be a product. Uh, uh, I would also add that now this is my personal view. This is not in the report that you know the people who. Um, uh, the celebrated people who come up with a um, uh, an idea in their dorm at uh, at UCLA notice my s- school bias um, uh, do that in part because there's a market for their their company when they develop it and who's the market well it's comprised of a lot of the bigger companies so so I think that's important too um, uh, in terms of maintaining a vibrant. Uh, economy but that's that's just um that's just my opinion uh and there's many on that task force who would who would certainly disagree and i think the men and women who run the agencies need to uh, have a very healthy debate on that and figure out what their uh, position is well we've uh, taken some time covering antitrust issues and i just want to make sure we don't give consumer protection short shrift here so let me turn to bill and ask you uh what are some of the major consumer protection and privacy issues that the report addresses a major issue on the consumer protection side is privacy itself and by that i mean where are we going to find leadership in the developing enforcement policy and the law of privacy? Will it be Washington? Will it be in the States? Will it be in the European Union? Right now, the States and the EU are ahead of Washington, even though it has been for 50 years, the role of the federal government to work out these basic questions. I was the enforcer of federal privacy law during my days at the FTC a few decades ago. Nowadays, when you're looking for the new developments in privacy law, 
People are going to California. People are looking to Brussels. It is time for the U.S. to get back into that game in a big way. And the report is recommending that the administration seriously ramp up its role in privacy policy and enforcement. Why do you think uh, U.S. federal enforcement has fallen behind the states and uh, also other jurisdictions such as Europe? And, and this is one of the anomalies, and that is enforcement, which is largely still in the hands of the Federal Trade Commission, has been robust. They have brought scores of cases dealing with privacy and data security. Where the action is really advancing, however, is in the development of entire regimes. And that is where the antitrust section has a particular concern. And that's where the report is saying to the agencies, come up with some basic rules and make sure that those rules don't impair competition while they are protecting the privacy rights that are most important to consumers. Yeah, and that, of course, you raise another big issue, the interplay between competition goals and consumer protection goals and how those can sometimes be at odds uh, in developing a privacy regime. So certainly uh, an important and very interesting area to watch as well. Uh, so obviously, uh, there's a lot going on in the world of antitrust and consumer protection, and we barely have the time to scratch the surface, unfortunately, on this program. And everybody should go read the full reports. Uh, but to try to get at what may be the most important issues, let me ask each of you in turn the same question. If you had to choose just three takeaways that we would want the leaders of the antitrust world under the Biden administration to take from this report, what would they be? And let me start with you, Rich. Uh, number one is uh, let's get behind the durable market power problem. Uh, let's get some some objective facts under 6B, 6B and then figure out uh, whether the consumer welfare standard uh, is right. And may, that may, you know, that's a question for the enforcers. And maybe it's also a question probably for Congress, but that's number one, because it's so fundamental. Number two, something we haven't talked about today, and that is the criminal program. I think there's a golden rule that he or she who is in the amnesty chair should never suffer as a result of that. I think um, the agency needs to take a look at that issue and see if there are things to do to uh, increase uh, the uh, incentive uh, uh, to self-report serious criminal activity. Uh, and number three, I think that the United States needs to own um, Section 2 law, uh, I think that um, the EU is getting out a little ahead of us, and so they need to look at uh, the proper standard. Um, is it Microsoft? Is it something else? And they obviously need to, uh, uh, you know, own the, uh, uh, the cases that they're, they're bringing against, uh, for example, uh, Google. Those would be the three, the three things. Thank you, Rich. Bill, how about you? What are you, what is your what are your top three takeaways? Well, my top three are number one, why do I get the fourth draft choice after Rich gets one, two, and three? <laughs> That's, That's just fair. the way it is. That's just the way it is, Bill. I'm sorry, buddy. <laughs> number one, and the report is very strong on this. We think antitrust enforcement ought to be apolitical. We are recommending that the administration and the White House not play a role in open investigations at the agencies. Number two, we think that the antitrust enforcers at the federal level should speak with one voice. We had a situation in this last administration where we actually had the Department of Justice 
filing a brief in opposition to the Federal Trade Commission in one of the most important cases the FTC had brought. We think that the government, the federal government, should speak with one voice, and these kinds of disputes between the agencies ought to be addressed in agency deliberations, not in disputes in front of our federal courts. Number three, we are very concerned about the fate of the FTC's ability to get redress for consumers in the fraud actions that have become the cornerstone of FTC consumer protection enforcement. There is a case pending right now before the Supreme Court in which the FTC has been defending against attacks on its authority, its ability to get any money back for consumers by going into court first and filing a case for a preliminary injunction and then a final adjudication on the merits in court rather than having to go into court first to the FTC later and then back into court after the FTC has finished its proceeding. So we are very concerned that the FTC could lose its ability to make consumers whole from the numerous frauds that the FTC prosecutes. If the FTC loses that authority in court, we are suggesting that there should be a congressional fix. Great. Well, uh, Rich and Bill, this has been incredibly fascinating. And I think what what this latest question highlights is just the, the degree of substantive issues, but also procedural issues um, that I think that the new administration will have to tackle. Um, and, and as Sergei has highlighted, a lot of uh, public attention is on this. A lot of congressional attention is on this. And um, I guess we, we all hope that we will come out better um, at the end uh, of the four years um, and that uh, many of these recommendations that have been uh, pulled together by um, experts at the section um, and in the industry will be taken seriously. Um, so before we let you go, um, we do like to ask all of our guests a few questions. And um, so I guess starting uh, Bill, with you, could you tell us something interesting about yourself that we wouldn't know about you if we just knew you professionally? Uh, you would probably discover if you heard me talking offline that I am what they call a streaker. And that is not someone who runs in flagrante through the neighborhood, but rather I have now with my daughter run 10 successive Chicago marathons and a few other races along the way. And I am a big booster of that particular sport. And the reason why is that anybody can do it. And it is wonderful fuel for the mind. Uh, a little bit of advice. Well, I will leave that for another question. I want to hear about Rich something I've never heard before. Rich? Well, uh, and this may be sort of professional, but uh, people who know me know I really uh, like to practice law. I mean, I, I really like it. Uh, not everybody <laughs> in the world does. I do. But my uh, favorite part of practicing law has nothing to do with antitrust. I'm a uh, death penalty person, um, and I've gotten several fortunate enough to have uh, been on teams that got people off of uh, death row. Um, I indeed have ongoing relationships with some of those people, um, and I'm now working with the uh, Innocence Project. So I'm passionate about law, but uh, antitrust is, um, is second. Well, both, uh, both honorable pastimes that um, take, take a lot of resilience. So um, good for you guys. Um, and then I guess, Rich, what advice do you have for students or younger lawyers who are looking to do what you do? I think there's three parts to a great career. Um, number one is find something you're interested in and good at and become excellent, something challenging, something hard, uh, and really master it. Uh, antitrust or, or trying cases or both uh, is perfect. Uh, number two is government service. 
people uh, in the United States. There is no universal military service anymore. I think it's very good for men and women uh, to go into government uh, at whatever level and 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 be public public servants and and think about the public interest and serve the public interest for at least part of your career. And number three, uh, consistent with what I just said, uh, pro bono. Um, uh, everybody has uh, talent that can be used. There's people on death row. There's people in jail who shouldn't be there. There's women who are uh, um, attacked viciously by partners or former partners, uh, all of whom need representation. And so uh, I suggest that... Um, uh, 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 people who want to have a great career become a part of the solution to that problem as well. Great. Um, all, all very good words of words of the wise. Um, Bill, advice what about you? you? What, what advice would you well, give? Well, this time I'm going to take the same draft choice that Rich already picked, and that is public service. I've spent almost a quarter of my year working, or of my career, working for the government, and it has been some of the most rewarding work I have done. And public service is not just working for the government. As Rich pointed out, there are many opportunities for pro bono activities, and those are just remarkably valuable for filling out a career and for expanding your worldview. And related to the government service. Let me also offer a little tidbit for anybody who spends most of their time on the defense side of their practice. Bringing cases as a plaintiff's lawyer is a lot of fun. That's obviously what you do when you're in government. In the private sector, it really can reignite your energy. And I suggest that uh, keep an eye out for those kinds of cases where you can serve your clients by vindicating their rights as well as by defending their rights. Well, certainly no better time um, to be thinking and looking out for pro bono opportunities. Um, there are, are numerous ones. Um, the section can certainly connect you with them. And um, I know certainly in, in view of the COVID pandemic that there is um, an urgent need for um, proper legal assistance um, across the board. Um, so, so thank you again, guys. I think that was wonderful. Um, so now it's, it's our last segment, what we call the Curious Hat. And now it's time for the Curious Hat. So I'm going to ask both of you guys to pick a number one through 25, and I will draw quote unquote, draw the question out of my virtual hat. Um, I guess start, starting with uh, you, Rich. 17. 17. Okay. Um, what was your favorite course in college? I... Um... Well, it was actually two. It was, I was very interested in uh, the Roosevelt administration <clears throat> and in the Civil War and Reconstruction. Those two um, were my favorites. Um, uh, and I uh, continue to read uh, <laughs> COVID, what I've been doing. I've been reading books and a lot of them have to do with the Roosevelt administration and Civil War and Reconstruction. So, uh uh, uh, that, that was an easy question. I'm glad I took 17. <laughs> is there, is there a course that you wish you would have taken that you didn't take? Yeah, I, uh, I, I should have, uh, Shakespeare is, uh, beyond brilliant and I should have, I should have gotten into that. I, I, I admire the people I know who, who really know uh, what a great writer he was and have a greater appreciation for him than I do. And I, and I wish I would have taken that. I, I will second that. Um, Bill, what about you? What Pick a number one through 25. I've got to go with 13. Okay, 13. Uh, okay, so if you couldn't live in the country where you do now, what country would you like to live in? Holy cow. <laughs> um, 
I would have to go with Canada. And one of the reasons why is that my son-in-law is a Canadian. And at least for two thirds of the year, it's wonderful up there. (laughs) Not so much right now. If I can come back and visit, that's fine by me. Have you ever lived abroad for uh, any period of time? I have not, but I've done a lot of international travel over the years, and that is another aspect of a career in antitrust that can be so much fun. So much of antitrust is international. It gets you on the road, and there is nothing like seeing a new capital city and spending a, a couple of down days checking around the, uh, the social scenes. Great. Yeah, I'm happy that you've been able to um, see the scenes um, while working and, and traveling. I know that's always difficult. Um, so, Rich and Bill, uh, thank you again for joining us today. Um, this has been uh, very insightful. Um, and again, encourage all of our listenership to read the full report, which you can access at Our Curious Amalgam. Um, and for everyone at home, thanks for listening to this episode of Our Curious Amalgam. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Our Curious Amalgam a competition, consumer protection, data protection, and privacy law podcast. It is produced and shared around the globe by ABA's Antitrust Law Section. The opinions expressed by the participants in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent their employer or other organizations. If you like what you heard or would like to become a member of the American Bar Association, please check out what the Antitrust Section has to offer at ambar.org antitrust. You can learn more about our podcast at at ourcuriousamalgam.com. If you have comments, suggestions, or podcast ideas, please reach out to us at podcast at ourcuriousamalgam.com. Until next time, thank you for listening.